interesting. So first, let's start with time. Uh, this is uh, related with the talk, the work I did uh, during my PhD, basically, when I was at Tokyo in Tokyo. Uh, I created this uh, library that is called Fault Tolerance Interface. It's a multi-level checkpointing library, um, and it's uh, quite simple to use. Um, the idea is that, well, you have some uh, initialization call where you pass a configuration file, and in this configuration file you will give all the parameters that you want to use for uh, your execution. Uh, you have a finalize, and basically the two important calls are uh, protect and snapshot. So protect is a function that we say, uh, where you would say to the library, to FTI, well, this is the data set that I want to protect uh, when you do a checkpoint, and then you're gonna give uh, just an ID, a pointer, um, you're gonna give the size of the data set, so if you're having a 2D or 3D array, you give the size here, and here you give the type of the data, uh, the data set. So if you have a floating point, a double floating point, or integer, or whatever it is, um, you give that information here. So FTA will register all, all these uh, data sets that you want to, uh, to save, or you want to protect, in order, in order to be able to restart. And then in your main loop, basically, you just call FTI snapshot, right? And then what that's gonna, what's gonna happen is, is when you come here, uh, you will make a checkpoint of your application. Now you can see that this is called at every iteration, uh, but you are not actually doing, FTA is not doing a checkpoint uh, of your uh, application at every iteration. What happens is that there are some timers inside FTI, and then in your configuration file that you uh, set here, you say uh, which frequency you want to checkpoint uh, for each one of the levels that uh, you want to checkpoint. So FTA offers four levels of checkpointing, that I'm gonna show uh, with traces here. Um, so these are uh, traces that we got on Subamet 2.0. Uh, this is the supercomputer at Tokyo Tech. I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, small, uh, but uh, that's okay, it should be uh, enough to explain. So basically, here in each line you have a process. Uh, you have uh, four nodes here. Each node has uh, 12 processes. So this is because we had two sockets of uh, six cores. Uh, so you see one, two, uh, three, and four nodes. And of course the uh, X axis is the time. Uh, what you can see is that the computing time is in yellow, and then uh, in, the, in purple or pink, uh, this is um, the FTI dedicated process uh, that does things in the background. So basically here uh, FTI gives you the option to dedicate one process per node to do only fault tolerance um, dedicated work. Um, and then, uh, for instance, when you want to write a checkpoint into the file system, uh, FTI will write that in local uh, storage if you have it, and then the dedicated process will uh, transfer that asynchronously uh, to the file system where your uh, application processes are still running. So, uh, as I say, this is one node. Uh, this is the dedicated process that you have in every node. Um, this is an option, you don't have to use it. But in this case, we, we uh, enable that option. Um, and then uh, you have checkpoints. So you see uh, the blue, the little blue line here is when you have a checkpoint in local, um, then you have, this is a checkpoint level two. Uh, so level one is just uh, writing your data in local. So in this case, you cannot checkpoint, you cannot uh, withstand a failure of a node because you will lose the data that you have in the node. But you can uh, tolerate uh, transient failures or uh, stuff like that. Uh, in checkpoint for level two, you will write your checkpoint uh, in local, and then you will copy that into your uh, neighbor, uh, so that if you have one node that goes down, you can retrieve your data. And then you have a level three that uses a little bit more complex uh, maths. Uh, basically, it's a read Salomon encoding that will uh, create some uh, encoded checkpoints uh, in such a way that you can actually tolerate multiple nodes going down, or even perhaps a rack. Uh, going down if you uh, distribute the, the data correctly. Um, and then finally you have a checkpoint level four, which is where you checkpoint in the file file system, uh, which is supposed to be a reliable storage. In this, uh, in this one, we also enable an option to compress the data set uh, before writing into the file file system. So this is the red line that you see here. This is the compression, and then uh, all the transfer to the file system is done, is done asynchronously. Uh, in this case, because it's a small example, 
Uh, the transfer to the file system is much faster so the, to the, than the compression. So actually compression is not really useful in this example, but it was just to show that it's, it's one of the options that you have in FTI. Uh, so you can see, for example, for level three, all the, all the encoding is done uh, asynchronously while the application processes are still running. So this is uh, multi-level checkpointing. Uh, in this way, you don't have to write uh, wait all the time, every time you make a checkpoint, uh, transfer completes into the file system and so on. Uh, because only the only thing that you care is when uh, your checkpoint is stored in local, uh, and then you can continue working on the application, and then uh, somebody else will take care of the rest. Uh, so that you can see, what you can see here is, um, this is a weak scaling uh, experiment. Um, we have uh, the number of cores here, so it's from 600 to almost 10,000 cores. Uh, the blue line is basically the checkpoint, so the, in the y-axis is the checkpoint overhead. Uh, the blue line, the dark blue line here is uh, the overhead uh, for uh, execution without checkpointing. So of course it's zero because we don't have checkpoints in this case. Uh, the light, dark, uh, light blue line is when you checkpoint into the power file system uh, using the, the, the classic checkpointing. And then uh, you have the four levels of uh, checkpointing with FTI here. So level one, two, three, and four in red, yellow, green, and I guess this is brown. And you can see that um, all of the, so there's some variability here, uh, but basically the, the overhead on the application is always around 5% or less than 5%. And this is because the only time that the application is stopped is the time that is required to store your data locally and all the rest is done in the background. In the background. Um, so and let me switch to um, the work that we have done about uh, space or uh, storage efficiency. Um, so the figure that you see here uh, is not a cold bar, actually. It's, uh, it's a floating point, in, float, floating point data set. Right? So uh, basically what you see here is each column is uh, is a floating point number. And this is how it will look more or less if you could actually see uh, your memory inside your computer. So uh, a black dot is a one, and a, uh, and a white dot is a zero, right? And, uh, and then you have, you, if you're familiar with the floating point representation, the first bit is the sign, then you have, uh, if you're, uh, depending on single or double precision, you have eight bits for the exponent, and then the rest is the mantissa, right? And then uh, what you see is obviously that the sign in your data set is, 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 a, is pretty constant, right? If you are uh, working with temperature values, which are mostly expressed in Kelvin, are always positive, e, the pressures are always positive. For, depending on, on your data set, that might change, but it's normal to, that to see that the, the sign is, is constant among the data set. The exponent is also very regular, right? Because you always have your numbers that are in the same order of magnitude, right? And then when you look at the, at the mantissa, you see this big chaotic uh, behavior here. And this is, of course, because when you go in the, into the least significant uh, bits of the mantissa, then you have uh, this high entropy uh, data over here. So looking at this, uh, we came up with a, a, you know, a, an idea that was, OK, if we want to compress data, um, floating point data sets, uh, maybe we don't need to compress everything, because it's probably not worth it. Uh, doing, and then we can decide what are the parts that we want to compress. Maybe there are some other parts that I don't need to compress because I will probably just lose time and I will not achieve a uh, good compression ratio. And perhaps in some applications, there are some uh, parts of the data that I can actually completely discard, and that will reduce the size uh, of, my, of my checkpoint or my data set that, uh, that I'm trying to store, right? So this is what we call the... Uh, or what, this is lossy floating point compression. <coughs> lossy is an option, so you can also have lossless for, for those that are uh, very, that need very accurate results. So uh, the idea is to compress the first bytes of the data set, okay? The first bytes of your floating point. So if you have, for example, a single uh, precision floating point, you have four bytes, so you can perhaps compress the first or the first two bytes of each floating point. And then you have another part that you will not compress because you will not get any compression out of it uh, because it's completely unpredictable. I, 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 
please remember that compression is about predicting the next value. So uh, this is so has has so much high entropy that it's, it's almost impossible to predict what is going to, what is coming next. And then there are pro probably some bytes that I say that I can completely discard uh, because I will just lose a little bit of precision, but that's within the error allowed by my application. Now, depending on what I'm uh, doing or what I'm going to do afterwards, I may do this or not. For example, if this is a checkpoint that I will use to restart my application, then perhaps I cannot discard any data because that will uh, probably increase the error of my result. But if you are writing some data sets, for example, for visualization purposes or for uh, post-execution uh, analysis, then you might, can, you might discard uh, part of the precision of the, of the accuracy here because you will not use it in this uh, uh, analytics or visualization work. So uh, we created this library uh, that we call LC, uh, and we compared it with uh, FPC. Uh, this, I have to say that all this comparison uh, was done by people uh, from NCAR, uh, which work on these uh, climate models. Uh, so I just send them the sources of, uh, of the library that, by the way, uh, are not available yet, but if you want to try the library, just send me a mail and I can, I can send you the sources. Uh, so these, all these results uh, are created to, to NCAR. <coughs> and so what we try to uh, analyze here is the compression ratio and the, um, and the error, right? Uh, for different data sets. So here you have uh, four data sets. Uh, please don't ask me what that means because I have no idea what these data sets mean, but you know, these are just climate simulation data sets. And then uh, each row is a uh, compression uh, with, with FPC, which is the other uh, compression library that they are using, uh, which was developed at the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And uh, LC is the library that we developed. Uh, and then uh, let me explain these numbers. Uh, basically, FPC 16 means I, 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 will, I will save, I will lose 16 bits out of the 32 bits uh, of my floating point precision. So I will keep 16, I will keep 20, I will keep 24, and I will keep 28, and I will keep 32. So here, in, if I keep 32, that means that I'm not losing, this is, this is lossless compression, I'm not losing any uh, bit of my data set. So of course the errors are zero, right? You see that uh, errors are zero, and what you see in parentheses here is the, um, is the compression ratio, right? So I achieve uh, 64, uh, I mean, the, the size of my data set is 64% of my original size, or 59, 44, 61, depending on the data set. Now, you can compare this one with LC10, which is also a lossless compression. So, of course, the error is zero because I'm not losing any bit of information. But you can see that we perform uh, not as great as they do uh, in compression ratio. So it's uh, 78, 66, if you compare here, 66 with 59. So they are doing better. Uh, and then if you compare uh, the other, the lossy uh, mechanism, so you, you should compare um, 11 with 24, so this one means actually that I'm losing one byte, that means eight, eight bits, and the two here means I'm losing uh, two bytes, so 16 bits. So please compare the 11 with 24 and the 12 uh, with uh, 16. So uh, I will make it like this is easier. This should, you should compare these two lines. Uh, basically what you will see is that they are systematically better in compression ratio. Uh, they achieve 15, you know, you see 15 versus 28. You see that the errors are actually the same, which is a, is a good thing. That means you are actually, we are both actually losing the same amount of uh, information. Uh, and this is uh, pretty much for all the dif different levels of uh, lossy uh, and lossless. They achieve most of the time a little bit better than us in compression ratio. Um, here is the, another error uh, type of measure. So basically, you have the same comparisons, uh, the same data sets. Um, they, they achieve, again, systematically a little bit better than us in compression ratio. However, when we go uh, to analyze the compression time and the reconstruction time, so basically the compression speed, uh, we are systematically a little bit better than them. And not just a little bit, in some cases we are actually twice as fast, uh, twice faster than them. So uh, depending on what, uh, what are your needs, you might need a high compression ratio regardless of the speed, <laughs> then you should use FPC if what you need is a speed 
and you don't care much about the size, uh, <laughs> then you probably you ch you choose our uh, library. So you can see that, for instance, <laughs> in this case, uh, so this is the compression time. Uh, so we are better than the here. In the reconstruction, we are almost twice faster in this case. Um, so, and, and what you can see the other results. Uh, again, here we uh, twice faster than them. Um, and, and, and this is uh, the same for the other data set here. So, uh, uh, so as I say, if you prefer uh, to reduce the space, you should use this one. If you need the speed, you probably you should. You should use this one. Uh, so, if anybody wants to use the library, just send me a mail. I, will, I can send you the sources, and this will be available online uh, pretty soon, also. Uh, now, if I want to talk a little bit about uh, energy uh, uh, efficiency, uh, power consumption, and the trade off between uh, reliability and, uh, and energy consumption, I want to present a uh, work that we did uh, recently that was. Um, uh, uh, showcase uh, in a workshop uh, at SC last uh, November. Uh, so what we did is that we integrated uh, a module that was developed at Argon National Lab. Uh, the module is uh, called MONIC, or MONIQ, uh, which is an mon energy monitoring tool uh, that uses performance filters um, uh, of the IBM machine. So the, the machine that we have in Argon is a, is a blue gene Q machine. Uh, so this module reads these performance counters. And basically what that gives you is um, the energy, the power consumption of the different uh, components of your machine. So you will basically, if you use this, uh, Monique, uh, you will get a file at the end of the execution that will, looks, that will look more or less like this. And then what you see here, is, um, is the time, and then you see the node car power consumption, then the chip core, the DRAM, the network, the SRAM, which is the cache, uh, the optics, PCI Express, and link chip core. And each line is basically a reading. So the readings are separated for about uh, 500 milliseconds. So uh, you have more or less two readings per second. Uh, and then using this data, you can make beautiful figures about the power consumption of uh, your application uh, during different uh, regions of, of, of the code or, or, or parts of the, of the application. So as I say, the time resolution is about 560 milliseconds. The space resolution is uh, 32 nodes. What, what this means is that actually the reading you get here for one line is the reading for uh, what they call uh, a drawer which is a set of 32 nodes, right? And this is important because when you do the experiment, you have to make sure that you are using the full 32 nodes of the drawer. If you use 16 cores only, uh, sorry, 16 nodes of the drawer, then you are probably getting readings for the work of your application plus the application of somebody else that is running, running on the other uh, 16 nodes or perhaps uh, the other 16 no nodes doing nothing, uh, which is also not accurate, right? Um, so uh, all the runs that you uh, do when using this tool uh, have to be a uh, multiple of 32 nodes to make sure that you are getting actually accurate uh, reading. Um, so uh, we did an experiment uh, with uh, uh, the molecular dynamic application that is called LAMPS. Uh, it's a, um, it, 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 allows you to make different types of simulations. Uh, in this case, we use a Leonard John simulation with about uh, with more than three billion atoms, and then we run this on uh, 512 nodes uh, using 64 MPi processes per node. So basically, this run was uh, over 32,000 processes, and then uh, what well, you have here the uh, specs of the machine is a is a Blue cube. I think it's uh, pretty well known. It's a water cool machine, you have a high the torus network, uh, and so on. Uh, and then uh, we integrated the Monic uh, tool inside FTI, so that basically when you initialize your application, when you initialize FTI with the FTI init uh, on your application, not only you are doing checkpoints, but you are also, also automatically getting uh, the power measurement readings uh, during the execution. Um, 
So this is this is basically something that you get for free uh, if you are running on an IBM machine because this only uh, this tool is only for uh, IBM machines right now. Uh, they are working on another uh, version of it that gets performance counters of Intel processors and so on. But at this point, this is only for IBM machines. Uh, so this is the uh, a figure that plots the power consumption of uh, this simulation. Uh, what you see here, so the, the, the y-axis is the power in kilowatts, and then uh, the x-axis is, of course, the time. Uh, and then we were checkpointing every six minutes, more or less. Um, and then the, the different colors that you see is the power for the different components of the, of the machine, as I explained before. Uh, something that I want to point out is that uh, the blue line here, the node, is actually the sum, the addition of all the other readers, right? So you get this is for the drawer. This is for just a single drawer, yeah. No, this is the for all the drawers okay, together, together for 500 uh, okay. nodes, 512 nodes. <coughs> mm, yeah. So you have the the blue is uh, the sum of all the others, right? And basically, what you can see is that so this blue line is the addition of all the other lines that are here, and you see that the the two main components are uh, the core, which is the green line. Uh, and the memory, the DRAM, that is the red line. All the other RAM, all the other lines, uh, the purple, yellow, blue, and so on, is, are pretty low, and that's, they, they don't change much neither. Um, so here we are doing uh, checkpointing, uh, multi-level checkpointing. So the first checkpoint that we, we see here is a level one checkpoint. Right? So you can see that there is a little period of time where uh, the power decreases, right? Um, and then this is because this is the time we are writing the data in, in local storage, and then the application continues, and then this is a level two checkpoint. And you can see that here we spend more time um, because here we are not using a dedicated process per node to do the transfer asynchronously. Here is synchronously, uh, meaning that the application processes have to stop, write in local, and send the, the data to the partner node, and then they can continue the execution. So you can see uh, basically that that, ha that is visible here. Uh, you can see this drop in the core, uh, the power consumption of the cores uh, here because this is the time we are doing the transfer uh, to the partner node. Then you have another level one, another, this is a level three. So it's a little bit longer because you have the Ritz Salomon encoding which takes a little bit more time. Then you have level one, level two, level one. And then here you have a level four which is writing into the file system. You see that this is much longer than the previous one because you are writing into the parallel system. Everything synchronously, meaning it's blocking, right? Um, and then, while well, the execution lasted for about 30,000 seconds in this case. Now, we did another an experiment uh, where we actually used the, the dedicated process that I, I presented previously. And then that dedicated process will do all the uh, fault tolerance work uh, in the background. And that's, this is what you get here. Now, you can see that. For the same checkpoint levels, one, two, three, or four, the only time the application is stopped is when you write the checkpoint data in local, and then all the rest is done in the background, and you don't even see it here, right? So what, that, what this means is that when you are using multi-level checkpointing with this uh, asynchronous uh, uh, feature that is uh, implemented in FTI, you get a power reading that is almost close to an execution without any checkpoint. <laughs> You know, you see that the time that is stopped is very small, and you have almost a constant uh, power reading here, same power consumption. Now, uh, it looks like the figure is not very well centered in the, in the slide, but it's actually done in purpose to show that here also we save about 20% uh, of execution time by using this asynchronous feature of FDI. So if you, can, if you compare with this one, here we were about 3,000 seconds by using this asynchronous um, for tolerance work in the ground, then the execution lasts only about 2,400 seconds. Okay, <clears throat> then uh, I'm going to talk about um, silent.